Hello, everyone. I'm Jordan Juxtop, and I'm here to present the work that my colleagues and I did measuring the privacy versus compatibility trade-off in preventing third-party stateful tracking on the web. The too-long-didn't-read version of what I'm about to present to you is that there were challenges in the user privacy on the web space, that stateful tracking of users by third parties was still dominant, despite all the interest and research in stateless techniques like browser fingerprinting, that attempting to solve uh, this problem and protect users from this kind of tracking ran into trade-offs between privacy and compatibility. It's not hard to achieve privacy by turning off third-party storage. Unfortunately, this breaks a fair amount of benign content online and will turn users off of such a solution. Worse, um, when one is trying to figure out what this trade-off should be, uh, one encounters the difficulty of measuring compatibility and breakage at any kind of automated scale. So our contributions in this space were partly technical and uh, partly experimental. We did devise a, an automatable, uh, heavily instrumented crawler that could implement uh, multiple policies that could be configured to test one policy against another. The instrumentation in our crawler allowed a quantitative compatibility assessment that I will detail later. And of course, um, we are presenting here the results from the case study crawl that we um, did using these uh, innovations and cross-checking with some manual analysis. So the motivation and background um, behind these challenges that we were attempting to address um, starts with our threat model. And our threat model is uh, that we are concerned with user tracking, in other words, the history reconstruction of user browsing across the web by third-party domains. So these are third parties that provide content such as advertising frameworks um, or analytics scripts or the like, and that they are doing this statefully. So here we are defining our scope to be stateful, for example, cookie-based tracking as opposed to fingerprint-based tracking. And we are ruling out of scope as well, active collusion between the first and third party for the purposes of uh, this work. The kind of tracking that we're interested in is both cross-site, that's our traditional tracking the user from website to website, if they all include the same third party content kind of tracking, and also cross-time tracking. Now we elaborate on why we consider this to be a threat in the paper, and I won't get into that here, uh, simply mentioning that in this case, we're not tracking the user from site A to site B to site C, we're tracking the same user across time as they come back uh, to the same site over and over again. Uh, where this gets interesting, as we detail in the paper, is if the user is logging in as a different user, uh, as a different um, persona at different times on this site, and how um, this could be uh, revealed through persistent third-party cross-time tracking, potentially. So these are the threats on our board, and the constraint that hangs over any potential solution um, to these problems is that they cannot break the web because even if we can solve the tracking problem thoroughly, if in so doing we break benign um, user anticipated uh, functionality on the web, uh, they won't use any kind of a solution that does this to their favorite websites. Before we did um, our work on implementing policy prototypes and uh, measuring, of course, we had to survey the field and see what is being deployed in production browsers. So this following summary I'm about to give you is um, scoped only to how browsers defend against abuse of third-party storage. This has nothing to do with like phishing or other, other defenses. We're looking only at the mechanisms used um, to uh, either prevent or mitigate third-party storage tracking, uh, the policy that engages that mechanism, and um, an estimate of the compatibility that results. We'll use a simple you know, good, bad, partial uh, kind of scoring here. Chrome, uh, traditionally, uh, at the time of our work, basically does nothing uh, to prevent third-party uh, storage-based tracking, but provides excellent compatibility. Microsoft Edge um, would block third-party storage, but only of known trackers in a filter list. And so this was able to retain good compatibility, but had the Achilles heel of depending on a filter list, as did Mozilla Firefox's um, general solution to this problem. Safari ITP, intelligent tracking um, protection, um, had long been a pioneer in more sophisticated defenses. By the time we were um, doing this comparison and measurement, um, their state was basically applying a global policy. All third party um, actors were subject to this policy, uh, but the mechanisms employed 
um, were not universal and were not global. Some things were blocked, some things were partitioned based on the first party site, some things were allowed but simply flushed out um, later. So um, our uh, sense here was that it obviously worked well enough, compatibility was, was good, and it had a reputation for preserving privacy pretty well, um, but we were um, not especially comfortable with the particular blend of mechanisms used here. In contrast to that, um, the Brave browser um, traditionally had taken a very aggressive um, privacy stance. Um, all third-party storage was blocked globally. No filter lists, uh, no heuristics, just all of it. Of course, this caused um, compatibility issues. Now, for completeness, I should mention um, Mozilla Firefox also features a strict mode in which all third-party storage is partitioned based on the first-party um, domain. And also that kind of coincident with our work and actually related to our work, um, the Brave browser team released an updated policy that uses uh, an ephemeral and semi-partitioned, um, but definitely ephemeral storage policy. So in our experiments and measurements, we implemented the following four policies, uh, kind of inspired by um, some of those real world policies and traditional baselines. We used a permissive policy. This is just the Chrome baseline. Um, third party storage works as always. We used a blocking policy. This is traditionally what Brave has done. And uh, it's also like the permissive policy built into Chrome. This is, this is available if you turn the appropriate tuning knobs. So there are no patches required here. Then we implemented patches um, to implement additional policies in the same browser that we could turn on or turn off as part of an experiment. One was um, partition storage or site keyed storage in the sense that all third party storage is associated with the first party website you were visiting when that third party was accessed. And so each new site that you go to that embeds that third party content, it's like they've never seen you before. It's all new storage so they can't track you across sites uh, in the simple traditional way. The page length policy ended up um, being related to what Brave would eventually uh, deploy as their new policy. And the key insight here was not to bother with partitioning as much as to keep the third party storage ephemeral. In other words, it lived, in our case, um, only as long as the top level um, document, the main, the main document was alive. Um, subframes could reload as many times as they wanted, send as many requests as they wanted. Their third party storage worked, uh, but when the main frame, the main page would reload or go to a new um, page, all the third-party storage went away. Our collection experiment covered uh, the Tranco top 1000 domains, out of which we extracted um, by following links on those landing pages, uh, a master list of about 3,400 URLs that we considered to be known good. There, there was actually content there that would succeed successfully load. And then we visited those in a, a stateful automated uh, set of crawls. This was two rounds of crawls because we wanted cross-site data, cross-time data as well as cross-site data um, using eight profiles, two of each for all four of our uh, policies that we were using. And this was using a custom build of Brave with our patches and the page graph instrumentation system. Uh, now, I'm not going to describe it in any detail here uh, in the talk. There's simply not time, but as we describe in the paper, we also did a side manual evaluation on a small sample of URLs um, extracted from this experiment. It was a very small set because of the um, very high uh, intensity of the manual labor that was involved, the number of visits, the number of people that were involved. Um, you can read more about that in the paper. That was basically just uh, kind of sanity checking our compatibility results. The difference between the browsers used here was simply that the manual um, assessment did not use the page graph um, instrumentation system while the automated um, crawls did. So page graph um, is a tool that's been developed and maintained by Brave Research for some time. It's uh, seen uh, success in previous published work. A simple synopsis of what it does is it augments the existing DOM tree inside the browser with additional nodes and edges that give you essentially the history of how the page loaded and behaved. And this turns out to be critical for our compatibility metrics. We assess trackability almost, um, almost exclusively, but primarily through potentially identifying cookies. In other words, flows of cookies to third party providers as we visit all these first party sites uh, that could be used to identify um, the profile and distinguish it from other profiles. And we rule out uh, cookies whose values are too short, 
almost any characters. We rule out cookies whose values are constant across profiles. So this does not appear to be identifying any particular single profile. We rule out cookies that appear too random. Uh, in other words, they're not consistent across the different first party sites that you visit. Um, so we rule those out. The ones that we look at are the ones that are consistent across first party sites for a given third party and are unique to a single profile, but then consistent within that profile. So having identified these cookies, we are now essentially identifying how many first party sites uh, this third party, uh, T3, can track um, users that come to these sites. By tallying up the total number of sites um, that this is true of, we can calculate how many first party sites these um, particular third parties can track users across. And it's quite large for the permissive policy and essentially nothing for all of the other policies. So this confirms our intuition, the kind of first principles by which these policies were designed. If you don't have um, persistent, accessible, non-partitioned third-party storage, you cannot use simple um, cross-site tracking techniques based on cookies or other persistent storage for third parties. When we look at the cross-time data, so in this case, we're not tracking across first-party sites. We're looking at a single first-party site and seeing how many third parties could track a user, a profile reliably uh, between the first and the second round of visits that we did. We see now um, that not only permissive allows a lot of cross-time tracking, but there are a number of flows that could be used for cross-time tracking for the site key or the partition storage. And this makes sense. Um, partitioning is about protecting against cross-site leaks of data for third parties, not about cross-time. While, of course, blocking prevents this and page length does as well because of its ephemeral nature. Now, the real meat of our um, work and kind of the, the, the challenge that we faced here was not really the trackability. We knew in advance more or less what the trackability numbers should be. It was simply a question of uh, confirming them empirically with the data that you could see in flight going to different third parties. The question was how do we at scale quantitatively assess um, or at least estimate what the compatibility or breakage impact of these different policies. And the approach, the automated approach, um, which was the important one because that was the one that could scale, um, looked like this. We identified third-party content, third-party uh, sub-documents, iframes essentially, and we ruled out um, ad frames because we anticipated that these would be a little too dynamic, would change a little too much from one uh, visit to another and could inject some noise into our methodology. So we focused on non-advertising uh, classified third-party frames. We looked at every instance when such a third-party frame was loaded, in other words, the context it was loaded in. So uh, this, this kind of tuple of first-party site URL, third-party frame URL for non-ad frames. And we collected all eight of the page graph uh, behavioral data sets for this particular frame as it loaded. And we included only those frames for which we had all eight. Of course, you know, sometimes it's the web, sometimes pages won't load or sometimes iframes won't load. And so you'd be missing the data for that. We ruled those out. We didn't want uh, missing data to affect any of this. So once we've identified those frames for which we had a full set of data, we picked one of the permissive um, page graph data sets as our baseline, uh, permissive two, and then we did a distance score between that um, behavioral data set and all the others. In other words, how different was the behavior? I'll mention in a moment how we actually did that comparison, but the intuition here is that uh, permissive one and permissive two should be about the closest we get in behavior to each other. And permissive two should be about as the farthest in behavior, if it differs at all, uh, from the blocking uh, policies, because those are the ones that should have the greatest potential for breaking uh, behavior since they're so uh, aggressive. And the question is, where do page length and site keyed fall in the middle? Are they closer to permissive one or are they closer to blocking one and two? The actual distance is computed from what we call a behavioral edge set. We take the page graph data, we extract out all the edges um, of interest, and we had a particular uh, empirical method for determining what the edges of interest were, and we boil them down to their essence so that we end up with essentially a bag of behaviors uh, for each frame. And these can be compared using a simple Jacquard uh, distance score. So from zero to one, uh, total divergence or total unity, total intersection between the sets. When we aggregate out all the scores across all the profiles, we end up with a curve showing us kind of the high level similarities or differences between uh, frames when they're loaded under different 
profiles. The ceiling is pretty low. It's well below 1.0. It's about 0.7, so that's about as good as we get. But notice all of the non-blocking um, curves are very close together, and they're all quite far apart from the blocking curve. So the intuition um, matches, the numbers match our intuition that page length and site keyed, uh, while they can prevent different kinds of tracking much better than permissive, they uh, score much closer to permissive in behaviors and therefore are less likely to disrupt compatibility. So in conclusion, we're quite cautiously, but uh, somewhat optimistic about the future of stateful tracking and protecting users from it. Um, the mechanisms that we saw working the best in this study are in fact where the state of the art is trending in privacy conscious browsers, whether it's Brave or whether it's Safari. I would put in a plug for Brave's page graph. Obviously, I'm biased having worked with the Brave privacy researchers um, on this project, uh, but I was very impressed with um, the maturity of the page graph software and the great richness of the instrumentation that it gives you. I would highly encourage it to any, highly um, recommend it to anyone doing this kind of work. Our data and our patches are available. Uh, there's a link to them in the paper. Thank you for taking the time to hear this. Thank you uh, for your interest. I hope you enjoy the paper and please don't hesitate to follow up with me um, if you have any questions offline. Thank you for your time.